<laughs> Absolutely. All right, Oren, you're up. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. I'm sure a few more people uh, will uh, join uh, momentarily, but AI2 tradition, we get started on time. It's really a, a unique and important pleasure um, and privilege for us to have R.T. Shahani, who's a leading correspondent uh, at NPR focused on uh, Silicon Valley and tech. And like uh, so many of us, actually uh, all of us, if you go far uh, enough back, she's uh, an immigrant and she's written a memoir about her experience. Uh, diversity and inclusion is a huge priority for us, so it's really uh, uh, an opportunity to hear about her experience, which was not by any means the, uh, the typical experience. As um, Nicole mentioned, we're going to get copies of her book and really appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to share this with us. And we're recording the talk, so it'll be shared uh, as broadly as possible because I think you have a really uh, important personal story to share. And with that, let me turn it over to you, please. Thank you, Oren. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, one, by way of job update, I should mention to you that I'm currently actually contributing to NPR on a variety of topics, and I'm soon going to have an announcement about a new show that I'm hosting. So to let you know, I have, um, I have a professional update. Um, more importantly, Oren, I wanted to thank you for letting me come and join your group, you know, the way that this happened by, by way of backstory is I DM'd Oren on Twitter. We follow each other. I've had uh, the great joy of interviewing him multiple times in the past and having science demystified for me as I try to tackle a hard subject. Uh, and I told him, hey, Oren, uh, I'm paraphrasing. Um, I wrote a book, my first book. Uh, it is not about big tech. It is not about one of the major companies of the day. Uh, I decided actually that the most important story I had to tell, and I felt some urgency and calling to tell, was actually about my personal journey. Uh, and that journey is, uh, for many, not what you would expect. Um, though actually, in some ways, I do believe it is typical. Um, in broad brushstrokes, I, you know, I joke, if you've heard my voice before, it is as NPR's uh, Silicon Valley correspondent, or as I like to call that title, my bosses did not appreciate me calling it this, but America's favorite Indian IT lady. That's how I would think of myself on the radio. <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of my sources just kind of assumed, oh, given the way she talks, the way she sounds, the work she's doing, it must be her parents were engineers or doctors and a lot of assumptions about my upbringing and my background. And I had this existential need to let you know the truth. Um, and the truth is that I grew up undocumented. I was a working class migrant kid in, in Queens, New York. Um, my family, we came and we overstayed tourist visas. And we ended up having a very not direct shot uh, to the American dream. And that, that is at the heart of my story. Um, my family was able to get papers through a process that is now derided as chain migration. Uh, it's interesting to me that chain migration has become a toxic or a dirty term, because when I hear it, I just think, oh, every family member is a link in the chain and you have your family member sponsor you and then your family can reunite and grow stronger and stronger. And don't we want that in our country? Um, by way of law, it seems we don't. Uh, the same process that got my family papers in a handful of years would today take 22 or 24 four years, which is to say the story even that I'm going to share is not possible anymore for many. We got our papers and we thought, okay, that's it, we're done. And I became a precocious scholarship kid at a very fancy private school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. To give you a sense of the wealth of that school, it costs a Tesla a year to attend. So that's, I mean, that's a lot of money uh, <laughs> and goes from kindergarten through 12th grade people paying that kind of money for their kids to attend. Um, and I thought I was on my way to sort of the, the model minority life. You know, I wanted to be a prosecutor when I grew up. I wanted to put away bad guys. Um, I was actually ashamed of my parents. I felt like um, their accents, their good but imperfect English, 
the jobs that they had were not enough. Uh, when I think back on it, uh, I, I feel embarrassed that that I thought my parents weren't enough because they had traveled a great distance themselves. My father um, was a shopkeeper. His version of the American dream was starting a store, an electronic store, on 28th Street and Broadway in Manhattan. A little bit of New York City trivia here. For those who like to visit, 28th and Broadway is known as the Wholesale District. Uh, it's now being rebranded as Nomad. But it's basically the place where a lot of first-generation immigrants got their start as small business owners, as job creators, um, building wealth for their family and employing others. So dad started a shop the exact same block where he used to shovel snow um, for $5 an hour. And one day, he and his kid brother were arrested. Now, this is in the 1990s um, during the drug wars. And according to New York State, my family business was a front for the Cali drug cartel of Colombia. Um, that is a terrifying thing for a kid to hear. <laughs> you wonder, oh my God, is my family a drug front? Oh my God, who is my father? A deep distrust, um, a shaking of one's faith in one's parents really sets in. And so for the first handful of years of my or months and nearly a couple of years of this case unfolding, I really, I wanted it to go away. I wanted to believe this wasn't happening and I was angry at my father. But here's the thing, as the case evolved and prosecutors, they did something very interesting. They offered my father and uncle a plea deal. And this is actually a standard piece of the justice system. This is why I say that in a lot of ways I consider my family story typical. They offered a plea deal. They said, hey, you know what? You guys are good family guys. You're just trying to feed your family. It's a very different tone from the first day in court. Um, why don't you each serve eight months and just put this matter behind you and go back to your lives? Now, if you don't take the plea deal, you're going to have what's called a trial penalty. I'm not sure if people are familiar with this concept, but a trial penalty basically means, yes, you have a constitutional right to trial, but if you use it, you will be slammed for it. So take your eight months and be on your way or go to trial and if convicted, do 14 years or something along those lines. That's a standard piece of the justice system. It's a pressure to basically say, okay, we're culpable of something. Um, and there's risk involved, right? Most people, statistically speaking, can't afford the risk of a trial. And that's why more than 99% of cases are settled by guilty plea um, to fight in the courts is to have privilege. Well, we thought it was going to be behind us that the men would serve eight months each and things would be done. But that's not actually what happened. After each of them took their guilty pleas, they were hit with a second surprise punishment. After serving their sentences, they were each tagged for mandatory deportation from the United States. And so the story I end up recounting in Here We Are is how we got to the point that my family that thought it was American and that was settled here ended up finding itself in America's uh, deportation system, which is actually a relatively new system as it works in modern times. My family was at the forefront of a new trend that really started in the 1990s and accelerated after the 9-11 attacks against my city, New York. At the point that my parents, my father and uncle rather, were tagged for deportation, something in me really changed. That I'm not sure if you've ever had an experience like this in your own life, that at first something you're confronting makes you ashamed of yourself. And then something finally happens. It's kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. And you begin to see the situation fundamentally differently. In my case, I went from feeling deep shame to basically feeling intense outrage, intense. I thought to myself, and by this point I was 19 years old when they were first dressed when I was 16, I thought to myself, at what point do we stop being punished? And why are they being punished in a way that punishes me, that punishes my mother, my siblings? So at that point, 
I basically became my family lawyer. Um, I thought as a kid, I'm going to throw myself into this legal battle. I'm going to write to the courts, to the lawyers, to politicians. I'm going to mount a campaign and I'm going to make the deportation stop and make it all better in 12 months. That was the timeline I'd given myself. I thought justice can be achieved in that time. Well, I started this campaign when I was 19 and I ended up fighting it until I was 30 years old. So it took a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, sometimes it felt like a sunk cost, like something that I wish we had never entered into, something that took a, a very big toll on my family, particularly on my father. My dad was a polyglot, spoke six languages fluently, multiplied large numbers in his head, had a photographic memory. But from the point of his arrest onward, he basically lost his livelihood, was not able to work again, was not able to start a business again, clearly under the constant threat of deportation. And what I recount in my book, Here We Are, is basically what it looks like for a family, a first generation working class immigrant family that has been turned in so many countries, in the US certainly and others as well, into an issue, a problem to be solved, a threat that you want to go away. What does it look like for that family from the inside? When you're battling legal threats from outside, and you're also just dealing with each other and stepping on each other's toes and having culture clashes and personality clashes and real issues with depression and health unfold, life continues to unfold underneath being turned into an issue. And so, or as you'd already mentioned, I wanted to have the opportunity to share that story with the communities and people who have been part of my reporting for years. Um, really, I'd say for two reasons. One is, I have the sense that our community has a lot more diversity in it than we often realize, think, acknowledge. Many people have stories that don't seem normal, um, but in fact are when you think about the range of human experiences that people are going through. So that was one, is just to sort of acknowledge who really are we and what kinds of life experiences do we bring to the table? And the other, as I've already hinted towards, is to open up the conversation around migration. I wanna just read you one little passage from the book that probably encapsulates a bit of why it felt really important to me to share the reality of our journey. I write, to migrate to America, to cross the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean or the Sonoran Desert is the boldest act of one's life. You do it to be the hero of your own story. Only God must have a sense of humor because as every undocumented immigrant knows, you can't cross over and stand proud. You have to be invisible. That's safer than being seen by the wrong people. Invisible heroes. That was my parents in a nutshell. And so I think that the invitation I want to give to people who themselves may have migrated one, two, even three generations ago who read the news and try to make sense of the immigrant issue is to consider that irrespective of the laws we've architected, which are always a work in progress, there is the fact of a human journey. And it's actually a heroic journey. People crossing over to a new place to try to survive, to try to build a life, to try to give their children opportunities they didn't have. That's fundamentally, I believe, and probably you do too, an act that is, we wanna see more of, not less of, that kind of courage and boldness. But unfortunately, we've created a political climate that has turned that thing into something criminal. So thank you for letting me give that overview. Um, I'm very capable of talking a lot and I could go on, but I wonder, would you like to get into a bit of a conversation or Q and A? Um. Th thank you, Artie, and um, uh, I think um, I'll, I'll also read questions in the chat. I don't know if you can see those. Um, I wanted I to start because I'm on my smartphone. So. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll read them out loud if they come in in the chat. I actually just wanted to ask um, a, a complete detailed question, but this uh, fancy school on the Upper East Side, 
uh, which one was it? Because I went to one uh, myself. I wonder. I, I went to Dalton. I don't know. Oh, I went to Burley. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, very similar. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to describe them via uh, the Tesla uh, uh, type <laughs> of tools. And it's the last thing you think that all of a sudden you would uh, find yourself in. Um, in, in, in that position. Um, one question I wanted to ask, because I'm just interested in uh, getting a little bit more of the facts. So what exactly was, was the outcome? Were you able to uh, hold off what really sounds like a, an attack uh, by the system? Yeah, as I write in my book, um, so my uncle was pretty much immediately deported um, and never allowed to return to the US. Um, you know, for the rest of his life. Um, my father, I was able, you know, I was able to win his case. And when I, you, I hesitate when I say that is because part of what I'm recounting in the book, it's what it feels like to win. Okay. And I'm talking about, you know, the struggle to stay in America. There are certainly other struggles people have undertaken. Like, you know, I notice this, for example, when I interview people who try to build a company um, and maybe fail or didn't succeed in the level that they were hoping, you undertake something that it's like it takes everything in your human capacity to pull it off. <laughs> it's not handed to you. You have to work for it. That's frankly what migration was for my family. You know, if we were the Shahani startup, it was corralling every single resource, making some great decisions and making some very bad decisions. I recount, I won't explain this, but I recount in the book um, some of the ways that we really hurt each other. And one of those ways actually ends up involving a kidnapping. Um, so I, I won't explain it here, but you know, leave it to say, uh, life can go very badly. <laughs> yeah. under, under that kind of pressure, yeah, that's right. People make some very bad decisions when you're under pressure. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, please, um, I have lots more questions, but I want to give people uh, a chance. Feel free to unmute and ask or just uh, post it in the chat. Uh, Swabha wrote, that's such a positive outlook, the immigrant's journey uh, as a hero's journey. Well, no, thank you for saying that. And I think that part of the challenge we're having and this is across issues this is not specific to migration is how do you correctly look at the problems at hand and then you know you want your political leadership you want your business leadership you want your educators to be able to band together and solve problems and i would say migration is a classic example of where we've just been gaslighting ourselves you know like it's interesting when you look at america's migration debate and how it's unfolded over the last few decades. Basically since the 1980s, since the last time there was a legalization under uh, Ronald Reagan, um, since that time, there's basically been a consensus among both Democrats and Republicans leading migration policy debate. And that consensus simply put is that America has too much migration and we have to stave off the constant new entries into our borders from every place that it occurs. Now, what's really interesting about that consensus, which really guides um, every major proposal that's been written around migration since the 80s, is that the consensus is based on factually wrong assumptions. So when you look at economists, when you look at government reports, when you look at the fact of an aging population in the US as well as European countries, what you actually see, and this is, you know, there's a book by the Nobel economist from last year, um, Esther Duflo and um, Banerjee, they're married, they're like an Italian Indian power couple. I love that. Um, and they actually write in their book, Good Economics for Hard Times. The problem with migration is not that there's too much of it, but there is, in fact, far too little of it. And so governments that have been focused on building border walls and saving off entrance are over-invested in solving for the wrong problem. The actual problem you have to solve for is how do you actually get people to leave where they're from, to leave familiar networks, to say goodbye to their families, and venture into something where the risk and reward are so 
so deeply unclear. I mean, I remember when my family came here and I wrote about this in the book, you know, we ended up being many people here. I'm sure you have a situation where your own parents told you we came here for a better life for you kids. Um, a lot of us don't stop to ask what that really means. What was the breaking point? What was the moment when you, mom or dad, felt that it was urgent to give us a better life? I learned that in the process of writing my book. I had no idea before writing my book that in Morocco, my family's originally of Indian origin, but I was born in Morocco. In Morocco, where we'd settled, we lived in a large joint family. And it was incredibly abusive. My father was not, he was a gentle person, but his extended family, um, they were very rough, or his family, they were very rough. Um, so much so that I didn't know this fact, my mom actually tried to take her own life. Um, that you can imagine when you're doing research and you come across something you didn't expect, it can give you a great deal of joy or it can really feel like the punch in the gut. Um, for me, it was the latter because it was my mom. And my mom is the most vibrant, sort of full of life human being I know. But things had gotten so bad for her in that part of the world that she didn't want to deal with it anymore. She was not able to take her own life. She was able to survive. And that finally became the impetus for my father to say, okay, okay, let's take our kids and let's leave this place. Let's go set off for a new life in America. Now, I share that anecdote and then to sort of coldly wrap it back to public policy. The fact is people do not want to leave what is familiar by and large. And I write about this in my story. My father had an incredibly hard time adjusting to America. America is culturally an incredibly isolating and lonely place compared to many other parts of the world. There's also winter, okay? Winter sucks if you've never had it before. And so, you know, it's just, it's interesting to me. I think about this constantly as a journalist and now as an author and, and, and writer is that disconnect between lived human experience and how we translate it or mistranslate it into policy debates. Thank you uh, for, for, for adding that. So a couple of questions that came in uh, earlier, again, they're not connected with what you just said, but uh, uh, yeah, people are in different places. Let me start with this one from Lakshmi. How could society achieve uh, equity for children, young people caught in a similar scenario, not due to their own decisions, but their parents? Are there mm -hmm. models from other countries that work, could work for us? Yeah, it's such an interesting question, Lakshmi, and I want to sort of tackle two parts of it. The latter first, we've talked a lot about how, for example, with young undocumented students who we call dreamers or who had DACA, who were DACA recipients, we talk about how they did nothing wrong and their parents made the decision to migrate. Something that strikes me about that framing or that statement is that parents want to protect their children. And so even if you do something such as crossing the border, which is breaking a law, are you fleeing violence? Are you fleeing a place where your daughter is likely to be raped? Um, you know, are you basically making sure that your kids are going to grow up, you know, with food and stability? And so I do think, and you know, no part of me is saying, hey, let's just open up those borders. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think we have to be careful about who we villainize in these conversations. And I'm just so sensitive to that because I know I was constantly in situations growing up where I was advocating for my father and people would want to make it sound like he's the bad guy and I'm the model minority. And I'm like, this guy was working seven days a week, 14 hours a day to make sure that I had food on the table. I mean, I can't throw them under the bus. So I just needed to share that that kind of reaction I have to a little bit of what we have in the air right now. Now, the first part of what you mentioned, so how do you support kids who are going through this kind of thing? It's really interesting to me that in writing this book, um, I so I never cried so much in my entire life as when I wrote Here We Are. Um, and you'll, when you read it, you'll get a sense. I mean, I promised you'll laugh a lot. You'll also cry. Um, and I didn't realize when putting this, this story on the page that for a lot of young people, 
it would actually seem like an incredibly empowering girl, young girls coming of age story. So I actually started hearing from students, for example, in San Francisco who reached out and actually a handful of them said they were petitioning to have my book added to citywide high school curriculum because they feel like they need to see more of young people who are dealt a bad hand by the world or by their parents' issues or whatnot taking charge. So something that's really struck me in that, and I'm so happy, you know, what's great is like when you write a book or when you create anything, whatever it is you're creating, you release it into the world and then people receive it in ways you did not expect or intend. Um, sometimes that's really bad. For example, the disinformation campaigns unfolding on Facebook. Uh, sometimes it's really good. Uh, for example, when you hear young people saying, oh, Arthur, your story of tragedy, I found it really inspiring and empowering. You know? <laughs> it's like, that's awesome. But part of what I think we have to do, I would say like at an individual level and then also at a society is being supportive adults. Um, there's actually a lot of data to back this up. When young people go through highly traumatic situations, one determining factor, it's according to this one study that actually followed young people over the course of more than three decades in Hawaii who'd gone through traumatic experiences in childhood. One determinant factor for success is not actually how much money you have. Um, oh, I'm just going to read feedback now. Okay. One determinant factor for success is actually, do you have a single stable adult in your life who is there for you consistently. And it's interesting because I found throughout my life, and this is actually through the corporate lesson, you know, for people that think about our corporate cultures, I have found in my life, you know, for example, when I became the scholarship cadet rarely right by Dalton, uh, or I got there and I wasn't doing great. I mean, it was the first time I was in a school where I wasn't getting straight A's. I was like, you know, kind of struggling for my B's. And my history teacher, Ms. Leonard, I'm in touch with her to this day, you know, decades later, Ms. Leonard pulled me aside one day after class. She's like, Artie, will you say it and talk to me? Uh, by the way, my name's Artie, but for 21 years, I let people call me Artie. I didn't want to, you know, correct that. Um, and so Artie, I want to talk to you about your writing. And it's funny because actually before she told me why she wanted to talk to me, I immediately had this apocalyptic feeling of, oh my God, I have failed I'm not good enough. They're about to kick me out right now, like immediate apocalypse, you know? <laughs> um, but she sat me down and she's like, here's the thing. In class, you seem to understand everything that's going on. You've clearly done your readings. You know how to participate. I kind of feel like she was telling me that I talked a lot in class. But anyway, she's like, but when I look at your written homework assignments, it just doesn't make any sense. And she was the person who taught me, and this rule of writing blew my mind when I first learned it. She's like, to write, what you're supposed to do is simply put down words on the page just like you speak. Write like you speak. And I thought she was crazy because I was like, no, 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 no. You're supposed to use incredibly big words and incredibly long sentences and show off how intellectual you are. And the harder it is to understand what you're saying, the better a writer you are. Like I was convinced that was the truth. And she was like, no, 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 no. But she didn't just have that talk with me. She literally spent, I believe the rest of the semester, if not the year, holding my hand and regularly checking in with me. She started to ask me about my family. When my father was arrested while I was at that school, she was the only adult I had told about her. She was at least the very first adult I had told about it, and I kept my cards very close for a while. She invited me to stay in her home when I needed a place to be that wasn't in my family's craziness. She basically adopted me. And I've had throughout my life people doing that for me. And I'm convinced, you know, it's funny because we have such a tendency to want to turn people into self-made stories you know, from undocumented immigrant to Silicon Valley. And then it's sort of this bootstraps narrative about how powerful you are amidst, you know, all that could go wrong. And whenever I do self-made stories, I'm like, oh, this is a fiction. Who is every invisible person who helped you along the way, who fed you when you couldn't eat, who taught you when you didn't know how to do things on your own, et cetera, et cetera, because I've had no shortage of them. So, you know, long-winded way of saying, Lakshmi, I think that 
it is good for us to be aware of public policy and how much we create a true safety net for people, particularly at a young age when it's so determinative of your future. I also think just at a personal level, how close do you stay to people in need and can you meaningfully be there for someone who doesn't have other adults in their lives? Um, thank you, Arthi. Uh, 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 apologies for uh, uh, mis mispronouncing your... Uh, oh, okay. Whatever. I have the confidence to tell you now, at least. <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I, I wanted to share, you know, for the uh, 69 or 68 other people uh, on the call, as, as I shared with you, for me personally, right, your story is so meaningful because um, my, my mother back in World War II days as a child was, a, was an undocumented uh, immigrant uh, with her parents in Italy, uh, mm -hmm. although uh, really more a, a refugee. And so mm -hmm. I think when you talk about, and she and her family uh, broke, broke the law in Italy, right? They snuck in uh, from Austria where they were facing uh, genocide. So I, I feel like part of what you're saying earlier there is that we need to be cognizant of the law, but we have to have compassion, right? People aren't doing this as a kind of uh, whimsy. Oh, well, you know, I feel like being in America, right? Because so I'm going to rip mm -hmm. my family from the fabric that they're in. They're going to put them in this huge uncertainty. People are doing it because they're, as you said, in, in, um, in, in dire straits. And then to, to, to your other point, right, it's their actions that then lead you know to other folks like you me and many others right uh, uh being uh contributing and participating citizens in in, in these uh these societies so it's your, your story is really you're representing right it's it's you're telling your own personal story but it's the story of 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 so, of so many people both in mm -hmm. the past and also currently right as as um mm -hmm. as we hear about you know, I, I just love that you're saying that, and I, I wanted you to bring it up because you'd mentioned it in, in DM on Twitter, and I was just like, it's, I, I want you to bring it up because I didn't know if it was public or not. Um, but, you know, Oren, I think that that's part of the, um, the challenge for us as leaders is to see our own paths more clearly. There is a tendency as life wears on, and life is hard, right? I mean, like every one of you is likely working incredibly hard towards some kind of goal that feels unachievable. It can be really hard to have compassion, okay? It really can. Um, in some ways, I feel like I wrote, here we are, because I wanted all of the little Shahanis that come after us to know their family story and to never be allowed to get away with some sort of narrative that is untrue. Like I want, cause I, I'm just so certain that, you know, the challenge with migration is that by design, you know, the foreigners who come in a generation, they're not gonna have in general political power. They're not gonna be able to have their rights realized. They're gonna be underrepresented in mainstream media, which I'm part of. And so part of what I hope to do, you know, or in, with you, with me, with others is, let's remember that that story that we're now seeing in the papers, that was our story, if not this generation, like literally a generation ago, that was us, you know. Very true. So uh, uh, trying to keep up with the questions coming in, William asks, do you see a way to change the overall mentality towards immigration in America? There are very entrenched opinions that seem to be getting even more entrenched over time. You know, it's interesting. This is where I'm going to conf confess. Sometimes I wonder if I'm on a fool's errand. And what I mean by that is um, just like there is mountains of data to say that the problem is not too much migration, it's far too little. There's also mountains of data to show that giving people data about migration does not change anyone's opinion. <laughs> like There has been multiple studies to document. Sorry, guys, the debate that's data driven. It has no effect. And so to some extent, I feel like in my heart, um, the thing I care about is just such a, you know, fantastic example of how facts don't matter, you know? So now why do I say that? Because yeah, of course I still remain hopeful. Like, you know, I don't, I don't, if you're a leader, I don't think you can give up hope. I think it's your job to keep hope and just find new clever kind of creative ways. Right. So I think that what I actually am concerned about, it's not, this kind of nebulous, foaming at the mouth, kind of, you know, 
hater who wants to like, you know, shoot or, or throw, throw, you know, objects at, at the newcomer. That's not actually sort of the person I think about a lot. I think a lot more about like you and me. And I think that this country, because it's so young and because so many, I mean, you know, you can look at our president, right? Like he is an immigrant if you consider immigrant to be second generation, which I mean, in most parts of the world, that still would be you know, like only in America, is it not? Um, it's interesting because actually in his niece, Mary Trump's book, she writes that, you know, Donald Trump's mother, um, and this is her description, was the kind of immigrant who's, you know, she came and then wanted to pull up the ladder behind her that kind of mentality. Now we all know people like that. I mean, there are people like that in my family. I've got a cousin who literally the only reason she was able to make America her home was because we did it first and then we sponsored her, but she's got a story in her head that she did it by herself and never broke any rules. And I'm like, okay, so when we were undocumented, does that sort of, you know, transpose to you in any way? So I just, I kind of just feel like a lot of the work we have to do is in our own backyard because I don't actually think that we're all on the same page. Um, I don't think that we all need to be on the same page, but, you know, Oren, you'd use that word compassion. And I feel that to the extent we can nurture that in any and all areas, you know, we'll be better off. Right. Well, fortunately we have a, a, a president who really stands for, for compassion and, uh, uh, let me stop there. Uh, Sachin asks, uh, can you speak to your family's experience in integrating with Indian diaspora in America. I do notice yeah. that among uh, Indian immigrants, there is a common prejudice against people who don't naturalize legally. Did this ever affect you or your, or your family? Yeah, it's such an interesting question, Sachin. Um, I would say, so here's the thing, if you kind of like think about it all, we're individual people, but we're sort of in movements and structures, right? Much of Indian migration, um, contemporary Indian migration to the U.S. that we're familiar with um, are, are, you know, basically professionals who came in the 60s and 70s who were the beneficiaries of really kind of big hearted and, and, and generous laws, um, both in India as well as in the U.S., my family came after that wave. So, you know, I'm in professional circles where basically most of the Indians around me come from fairly wealthy families who were professionals and migrated on professional visas. Um, my family and the wave thereafter, you can basically say from the 80s onwards, is much more working class. And so you're going to find again... Um, and, and these are not the Indians who have sort of reached the ranks of power in the U.S., whether it's in politics and business or media. But you're going to find, again, as my family represents, a lot of working class stories. And basically, if you're working class, if you started off poorer, poorer, you are by design going to be breaking more laws. You just have fewer resources to be able to find laws to comply with. Right. So I think that part of the work in the Indian community and, and the diaspora here is to not overstate what happened in the 60s and 70s as somehow the ongoing and perpetual truth for new waves, because objectively speaking, it's not. If you look at the data now for Asian Americans in the US, you see a huge disconnect where there's great wealth for the earlier migrants and there's just poverty for the newcomers. I mean, I can point you to Queens, New York, where I grew up, where there's no shortage of working class Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, who are the ones sweeping the streets, running the motels, not even owning the motels, cleaning the motels, cleaning at the airport, whatnot. So I would hope that in the South Asian diaspora, they see being slang for people of South Asian descent, I hope that we can um, in some ways actually absorb into our own politics more American values of equality. Because I think what can be really hard for South Asian diaspora is many of us come from places where deep inequality is the norm. Child servants are a norm. Bourgeois families are paying peanuts to have, you know, labor do all their work for cheap. And so we have this tolerance for huge, vast inequality that we've learned from back home. And what I hope is that our time in America can actually teach us to not be okay with that level of inequality and affect then 
sort of the values that we see around the world. So that's, yeah, that's my take, I, you know, on that. So I think this leads naturally to the next question from Jay and, and generalizing that beyond the uh, uh, South, A South Asian um, uh, culture, he's asking uh, the plea bargain process, trial penalty mm -hmm. are extremely regressive as you described. Do you see an effective way to change this policy or the others that hold the less privileged back? That's a great question. And, you know, I think that something that holds the U.S. back in a lot of ways, I mean, there's just so many aspects of the criminal justice system that are broken. Um, there are efforts to change how the courts work, but on the trial penalty, I'm not actually aware of efforts to undo that because it's so central to the processing of a huge caseload. So the system, you know, and this really, it's interesting to me how much this comes as a surprise to people. Like the vast, 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 vast majority of people will never go to trial. I mean, like literally less than 1% of people will exercise that right to trial. And the trial penalty is needed to basically incentivize people to accept the pleas because the acceptance of the plea deal is basically the way that you affirm that the system is working. So it's in the incentives of the actors, you know, for example, a prosecutor. What happened in my family's case? There was a prosecutor that poured years into trying to get the Kali drug cartel. What did they actually get? They got a couple of guys who wear polyester pants and pay less sneakers and were trying to feed their families. But they needed to have some conviction. They needed something to show that their work was worth it, that they should be rewarded for their work. And by the way, my synopsis that I'm telling you of what happened in my family story, it's not actually my synopsis. I went back and I interviewed the judge, the criminal court judge who oversaw the entire case. And in our interviews together, we had three separate meetings. He's actually the one who recounted to me going back and, and reviewing the file by himself, how he just thought that my you know father and uncle got a bum deal and that bum deal was just standard practice in the system. Wow. Uh, so a question from Peter. What was it eventually that led to you winning your case? Was there a particular turning point or event there? I would say, and this is where I would encourage you to, to read the story. I promise it's a, it's a quick page turning read. Um, it was a combination of a waiting game um, in practice laying low. Uh, at some point in my father's case, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, an agency that we know as ICE, lost his file. They just lost it. And that basically worked to our benefit because when a file is lost by the bureaucracy, you can just kind of wait around. And then ultimately, how we decisively won the case it probably had to do with me building a political campaign, gathering letters of support, including from a Republican member of Congress. I was actually able to get support from a Republican before I could from a Democrat. And that to me was also really telling about how these issues work. I don't actually believe the partisan lines are super clear. I think that political leadership in the U.S. is by and large confused about what it believes on these issues. And you can actually even look at the, you know, the, the Democratic primaries are over, but when they existed and we had an incredibly crowded set of primaries, you could go and look at the migration platforms of all the major candidates. I mean, they were all over the place. <laughs> you, know, you had the sense of this candidate doesn't have a clear vision, but man, they, they sure are trying to respond to various interest groups knocking on their door. Got it. Uh, I have to say again, um, uh, I'm I, I, I'm planning to to read your book, but part of me is uh, is terrified. Just to be honest, because it also just emotionally, I, I feel like I'm on the verge of tears right now in reading mm -hmm. about some of the things you're describing. Just as you know, I don't know, maybe it makes me a a, a certain kind of person, but I just I I know it's going to be just just heart wrenching. And so with that, maybe I'll I'll go to the to the last question here. We don't want to. Uh, 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 overstay, but this is from uh, Slater, who asks about this 11 years that you talked about is such a long time to fight such an emotional battle, and you mm -hmm. describe the teacher and so on, but is there anything uh, you can share with us more, just how did you hold on, how did you, how did you survive? Yeah, no, it's so interesting, I would say that it was like, 
I called it in my book, a more than decade long anxiety attack. So from age 19 to 30, I was so wound up because I had the sense that we, our existence was being threatened. And when you feel like an existential threat to your survival, um, you can derive a lot of energy from that. It's anxious energy though. And interestingly, when that case finally ended, how I reacted to the end, it was just so funny. It's like, and this is, if you've ever had a really hard experience in life, maybe a loved one or yourself dealing with cancer or some major medical issue or, you know, anything, a prolonged fight, when it's finally over, like, I remember like thinking to myself, oh, I don't have to keep fighting this anymore. Now, what do I do with myself? <laughs> I remember feeling like, totally confused because my entire identity had been this oppositional young woman, you know, punching at some invisible system. And actually, when I finally didn't have to fight that system anymore, that's when I pivoted into journalism. I was like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. Maybe I can be a journalist. And, you know, journalism to me, it was this intriguing land because I had been a source for journalists a lot. Actually, my first foray into NPR was not as their correspondent, it was at a, as a source. I was visiting a, a set of prisons in New York where immigrants were detained uh, after the 9-11 attacks and documenting with my friends and colleagues how prisoners had uh, attack dogs set on them, how guards were beating people up indiscriminately, whatnot. And this documented abuse, we were handing it over to journalists at NPR. So I actually started as a source for the company. And then years later, when I became interested in journalism, the same person who reported the stories that we'd handed him was like, you're a journalist now? Like, maybe you should look into a job here. And so it was just so interesting how life unfolds, right? Because like, I literally just had no idea what I was going to do when I didn't have to fight anymore. Like basically, you know, what is my profession when I'm not busy being an immigrant daughter? That was really like the question for me. And, um, and this is it. <laughs> well, that is, that is particularly uh, I inspiring. Arthi, thank you so much for, for mm -hmm. writing this book and uh, mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. coming to, uh, to share with us. Uh, we're going to uh, send this out far, far and wide. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I just ask people to unmute uh, for, for applause. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to your show and, uh, and to reading the book. Please take thank care. Thank you so much. Mm, take care. Thank you so much. Okay.